because they more or less took over the conventional army. They were supposed to be an elite, as they were formed by Khomeini, they were an elite group to safeguard the principles of the revolution. Over the years, because of their economic power as well, because they have the best weapons, they took over the north. So, so when you talk about the Iranian army nowadays, it's basically the revolutionary guards with some, you know, non-ideological, it's hard to say non-ideological because almost everyone in Iran is ideological in terms of defending the revolution, if you work for the government. But the revolutionary guards, which are the neck plus ultra of uh, principles of the Islamic revolution, they are the army now. And as we discussed in the beginning, now they are the state. The so so the, the Rafsanjani group has no real military uh, power no, behind it. Thing. No, they, well, then that's, that's more or less the end of the story then, isn't it? It is because they, they, they don't control anything. The only thing that could happen, which is, I, I assume everyone all over the world who is passionate about human rights and real democracy is a movement coming out from the streets. So on Monday, if we have 300, 400,000 people in the streets of Tehran in a real peaceful demonstration against the regime, this thing could blow out of proportion. I'm not sure they're going to take it very lightly. The repression can be Extreme. Yeah, they would. They would need it. They would need splits in the armed forces for for this to have effect. Exactly. And and this is also very crazy because a few days ago we were getting reports from Iran that parts of the Republican Guards were allied with Musavi. That was not the case. Otherwise, the the split would be public by now, and they would not be supporting the crackdown in the streets for the past two days, on Saturday and Sunday. Let's talk about U.S. policy here because. Uh, watching the U.S. media covering this, you get this sense of this sort of benign democratic power watching this uh, gr emerging democracy and then it, this democracy movement being suppressed and all of this. But, but they, they don't want to deal with the fact that Ahmadinejad and the Supreme Leader's faction, how much they've been helped by the sabre rattling of the United States by Israel and, and continue to be by the fact that the U.S. doesn't want to completely distance itself from the Israeli proposal for the military option. Absolutely. And, you know, Ahmadinejad and Bush, they were perfect as interlocutors because they're blaming each other all the time. And Ahmadinejad is still thinking in Bush terms. I think he, has, he hasn't down on him and the hardliners in Iran that now a new kind of dialogue is possible if we follow Obama at his word, of course, if it's not a pie-in-the-sky scheme. But they're still thinking in terms of the, eight, uh, the last eight Bush years. And most people in Iran, if, if we talk even to poor people, say, look, if America respects our independence, if they don't interfere with our foreign policy, if they respect the fact that we are allowed to have a civilian nuclear program, it's fine. We can, it's not great Satan anymore. We're open to dialogue. But no, try to tell to tell this to the, to the Washington elite. It's, it's still impossible. But they're still more or less in an undisguised Cold War mood, but not against Russia. Okay, of course, against Russia, but against Iran, treating Iran as a Cold War foe. I've been watching interviews with people. And they're asking, why do you support Ahmadinejad? And many of his supporters have said, well, you know, he's not that great in managing the economy, although maybe he sent my cousin a little bit of money in an envelope. But... He stands up for our national dignity. He stands up to the Americans. So every aggressive word that comes from Israel to the United States is just political capital for Ahmadinejad to come back with some more rhetoric. It is. And uh, I'm sure this is part of the calculation of the Ahmadinejad faction. Okay, uh, let's say we get rid of this uh, green problem in the next two or three weeks. Then we concentrate on our relations with the U.S., but under our own terms. And we are sure that they're going to keep attacking us. The rhetoric would mount. And Israel will be trying to tell the international community, no, Iran is a danger to the whole world. This is going to be a new Holocaust, etc., etc. So it's perfect for us because with this, we just use it with publishing in Farsi and Iranian national opinion will rally behind us. This is part of their calculation, of course. They're still not thinking in terms of, let's say, the Obama effect. And by the way, the Green Revolution in uh, Iran is not an Obama effect, as uh, a lot of people in the uh, in U.S. corporate media is saying. It's a completely different phenomenon.
It is indigenous, it is natural, and it is, okay, it is an urban phenomenon that came out of people who are, they, they could see what Ahmadinejad was doing wrong, they could see that it was an alternative, even within the framework of the Islamic Republic by Musavi. They know that Musavi is not an uber reformist, he's a pragmatic, moderate conservative, but rallying behind him will be a way out of this impasse. That's what happened. This, this is the meaning of this Green Revolution. It was not fomented by people who travel to Dubai, go to Facebook and buy Louis Vuitton in Dubai. That's not the story. So Western policy, uh, I should say this morning on uh, Sunday morning, George Stepanopoulos show, Stepanopoulos says, well, I guess this opens the way for the Israeli argument for military power against Iran. Uh, that kind of because language it, is exactly you know, already, what these people want to consolidate their position. Exactly, this is exactly what the neocons, Likudniks, Israeli firsters, all these people want. And industrial military complex, of course. This is what they want. They need a war. And now they have the perfect foe. They have Saddam Hussein redux. They have Osama bin Laden redux. And now Mahmoud Ahmadinejad now is the uber bogey man of the 21st century. On top of it, he stole an election. It's perfect. It's on a play. You give war on a play. You know what, what? I'm really sad about all this because I've been going to Iran for a long time. I have Iranian friends. I love the country. I always love the culture. And the... What the play of the regime nowadays was to hand out a war on a plate to Israel. Well, thank you very much, Pepe. And just one little, li one little additional note from me. Um, it would have been interesting if in the year 2000, Al Gore had, had the courage to stand up the way Musavi had and denounce that election. Perhaps we would have had a different America and we would have seen hundreds of thousands of people on American streets. Uh, but but he didn't, and we'll see where all this leads. And it's great, because when you go to the American blogosphere, a lot of American voters are saying the same thing. If only we had the guts to do this in 2000. Thanks very much for joining us, Pepe. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for having me. And thank Take you care. for joining us on The Real News Network.